Good morning. Dear FISA members, federations, delegates, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and privilege to officially open the FISA 2020 Extraordinary Congress. It's certainly one of the few key moments in the life of our organization. Indeed, we have a once every four years the formal and unique opportunity to adapt, to amend, to change, to enrich and improve our statutes and the rules of racing. This is usual and even necessary in every organization. Not because we or our predecessors have not been right. And allow me actually to have a special thought to all those who have created and developed these articles and rules up to where they are today. So not because they are not right, but simply because our environment is moving rather more quickly than slowly, in fact. And it is therefore essential that we have this flexibility from time to time to adapt to this changing environment. 
A very warm welcome to you all, the delegates of FISA's member federations. Thank you for joining. You are taking part to a very important moment of our organization, a uh, not that frequent moment. And thank you for all your hard work for our sport, especially during this uh, very difficult period of time. I would like to welcome our honorary president, Dennis Oswald. As you all know, he is uh, certainly among the few very best specialists in sport organization regulation. And it's a real privilege to benefit from uh, his high expertise in Swiss law as well. And this, I must uh, admit, at a reasonable price for, for FISA. More seriously, uh, thank you very much, Dennis, for your availability and your unfailing support to your sport. Welcome to our dedicated council members. Thank you again for all your hard work for our sport. It is noticed and much appreciated. A uh, presentation was made uh, yesterday and therefore I don't think necessary to uh, make it again. Dear delegates, I have just said earlier, this external Congress is first and foremost dedicated to review our statutes and rules of racing and possibly adopt the proposed changes. We have reached today the final step of a process that was initiated after the last external Congress that was held in February 2017 in Tokyo. We relaunched the two working groups in 2018, one dedicated to governance and statutes, the second for the competition and rules. I must say that it has been a quite intense journey with an immense work. Please allow me to express my sincere gratitude and warm thank you to the members of these working groups. For the governance working group, thank you to Anna Marie Phelps, Algidas Rasnadas, and Trisha Smith. With the coordination and support from governance manager Lucy Trochet and executive director Matt Smith. I am sure the members of the group will join me for a special thank you to Lucy for the huge job she has delivered successfully. I must say that on many occasions, we requested and had the valued support and advice from our honorary president. As for the rules, thank you to the great team made of Chris Groot, Patrick Rombot, Lee Spear, Mike Tanner, and Mike Williams. Under the coordination initially from uh, Colin Osmond, and then from Cameron Allen and Matt Smith. And here as well, a special thank you to Cam for the massive job to deliver all the work connected to the rules. The intention from the very beginning was to share with you the member federations. We took every opportunity to provide updates on the discussions and as importantly, to get your feedback and your inputs all along the way during this exercise. The full documentation package related to the proposed changes was posted on the website according to the statutory deadlines and you were notified uh, through circulars. But I would say even more than that, in this particular context, in these adverse circumstances of the health crisis and the pandemic, the executive committee decided to maintain the initial dates for this Congress and to hold it virtually by video conference. Also, the new technology and this webinar software do allow to, to stage such a meeting. This is, I must say, not ideal and the best conditions for expression, for discussion, and for the debate. We are conscious that more than ever in this context, the preparation and the anticipation are crucial. In that respect, we have developed a series of video presentations and held virtual 
member federations consultation meetings on both the statutes and the rules to collect your comments or suggestions. Thank you to all of those who have participated in these sessions. I hope that you have found this uh, uh, materials and the approach useful and that it has helped you uh, to understand and to build your positioning. This does not mean that uh, we will not have discussion today. You have the full opportunity to contribute. At the same time, uh, there will be no surprises and we have given all opportunities to express views and contribute in the preparation phase, we expect to avoid long controversial debate on the proposed changes. We have scheduled two three hour sessions. We think that going beyond three hours for a virtual meeting is not ideal indeed. We aim at covering all discussions and presentation at the session today, or at least most of it, on the review of the statutes, the rules of racing, and the respective associated appendices. We want also to have the discussions related to uh, agenda item five and possibly uh, six. Those points are related to additional subjects, notably on the consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic and the postponement of the Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games, and equally uh, the FISA's proposal to the IOC for the Paris 2024 rowing program. And uh, we will proceed with the votes on the session tomorrow. We will provide you later on our suggestion for the voting to make it efficient while keeping the formal dimension, of course. Before we start, we will present you the key technological aspects. It might be redundant for most of you as uh, this was presented a few times and for the ordinary Congress yesterday. However, we want the two Congresses be being held independently and there are new delegates today. Therefore, from a formal point of view, especially when it comes to the voting procedure, we want to ensure that all delegates will have received the same and all the information and the necessary elements. To do this, I'm passing on to FISA Governance Manager, Lucy Trosher. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. Welcome to everybody today. I will start with the simultaneous translation, simultaneous interpretation. Uh, you will see that at the bottom of your screen, there is a symbol for interpretation. Now, if you click on this, you will have the options to listen to the entire Congress in English or in French. We do recommend that you do not use the option mute original audio. So if you would like to now select your chosen language, um, please go ahead and test it. And hopefully you will be hearing in that preferred language. And if you are having any problems, then please do use one of our support lines in order to resolve any problems with the interpretation. This information was included in the email that was sent to you with your authentication details. And so please do refer to that if need to be. So if you are seeing this slide here, and obviously you're listening to us now, it means that you've successfully logged in and hopefully haven't had too many problems. Um, I'm going to remind people that they do need to keep a strong internet connection, preferably you've got a cabled internet connection and you're connected using a computer with the Chrome browser for best performance. Ideally, you're not using a telephone or a tablet. We do not recommend this. We also ask delegates to have microphone cameras and speakers, and hopefully these are already built into your laptop. And as you will have seen, we're using the Zoom video conferencing services. I'd like to explain to you now how to raise a question and make comments 
we would like you to use the Q&A option and raise hand option that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to type in your question, please use the Q&A and we will respond to it, either a written response or verbally during the Congress. If you would like to take the floor and speak, please use the raise hand option. And then we will change your status from attendee to panelist. That means we'll then be able to switch your video on and you will be able to speak. Please note that when we do change your status, there will be a slight interruption of five to 10 seconds possibly. This is normal, please don't panic. You will then be reconnected to the webinar. You will then just need to wait for the president to ask you to speak and you will be unmuted and your video will be switched on. You will have probably noticed that there is also a chat function at uh, the bottom of your screen. There's a little symbol there. We have disabled this for most of its functionality. We've tried to limit it uh, for better management of the meeting today. And so we ask delegates ideally not to use the chat function and to use the Q&A and raise hand for any questions and comments. The chat function may be used by the meeting organizers if we need to communicate with, di with delegates directly. If you do experience some technical problems during the Congress, you do have those support lines. A few suggestions here though, if you are disconnected from the Zoom webinar, please just wait a moment because you may be reconnected automatically. Alternatively, you could try switching to the Lumi voting platform and click on the Zoom webinar link that is at the bottom of the information page and the Zoom application will then open up. If your, for example, your screen freezes, try the refresh button. But as I say, if you are having experience, uh, if you are experiencing technical problems, don't hesitate to contact one of our support lines who will help you resolve the problems. So now we will take you through the voting process. And for that, I will now hand you back to Matt. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I would like to say welcome as well. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Um, only member federations that have paid their fees a subscription fee have the right to vote today and tomorrow. Um, and for voting, only the designated voting delegate for each member federation can actually vote. Um, the voting delegate will need to switch to the voting platform, the Lumi voting platform at the time of the vote. I will give you that instruction. Um, all other participants will stay in the Zoom webinar window. So when a vote is announced by me, I will instruct the voting delegates to switch to the Lumi voting platform that you logged into at the start of the meeting. And now I'll ask P. Fowler, Managing Director of uh, Lumi UK to give some more instructions on voting. Pete, over to you. Thank you very much, Matt, and hello to everybody. So I am joining you um, from London and supporting this voting process uh, throughout uh, the next two days. So I'd just like to explain how to vote, and that is for the voting delegates only. At the time of the vote, you will be required to minimise this Zoom webinar meeting. In some cases, to minimise, you may have to click escape first to then view the minimise icon within the Zoom webinar window. The reason for requiring to minimize is that all voting will take place in the Lumi voting platform. That is the platform that you logged into this morning where you've then clicked on a link for Zoom webinar. At the time of the vote, we will automatically push the poll to you. That will take over the state of the Lumi voting platform. Here, it will state that the poll is open it will state the motion text and the voting options possible to you. To vote, you simply select your desired choice. It will become highlighted in blue. Importantly, a vote received message will also appear just above the voting options. 
you are free to change your vote if required. To do so, you simply click on another choice. Again, that will become highlighted and the vote received message will reflect that. You can change your mind as much as you wish whilst the poll remains open. The vote that is cast will be the, the vote, the last click that you make uh, and the, the last vote received message that you see. Matt will state when the poll is about to be closed. Once the poll is closed, the voting platform will return to that logo state and you are then free to go back to Zoom to then see the results and of course continue watching the proceedings of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. We will now proceed with a test. So voting delegates, please pay attention. This will be test vote A. Voting delegates, please now switch to the Lumi voting platform to vote on the following motion. Who is the vice president of FISA? Angela Merkel, Kamala Harris, Tricia Smith, or abstain. Please open the voting. Voting is open. Trish is getting nervous. In 10 seconds, we will close the vote. Please close the vote. The vote is closed. The results are, please share the screen, Pete. 135 possible votes, 24 abstentions, 111 valid votes cast. Angela Merkel received six votes. Kamala Harris, sorry, Joe Biden received zero and Tricia Smith, 105 votes. So 94.5% majority, four abstains. Tricia, you remain vice president of FISA. We now will move, Pete, Pete please uh, put back, I have to go back into my screen. Thank you. We go back to Jean-Christophe. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, again, my apologies for the disruption in the translation uh, yesterday. It was my idea to include a bit of French in the Congress. I have uh, uh, good, good news and bad news. Good news is for those who want to have the English version of my speech, this will be published as soon as possible. So you will have access to uh, the speech uh, uh, very soon on the website. And the bad news is that I won't speak in French today and you will have to, to suffer with my English. We appreciate uh, that uh, a three hour virtual meeting talking about statutes and rules uh, of racing is quite tiring. Uh, and therefore we envision uh, a short 10 to 15 minutes break at some stage during uh, this session this morning. So we are now ready to move to point two of the agenda, identification of the delegates and confirmation of their authority. The delegates uh, validated the list of, uh, of, of delegates was transmitted to Lumi, uh, the company providing uh, the voting platform. And you have then received uh, an email from uh, Lumi, which provides the necessary details to connect and uh, join the Congress. The executive director will first make uh, the roll call with the member federation that have registered at least one delegate for this Congress. This is about the member federations formally registered to this external Congress. In terms of the actual member federation and delegates connected, uh, LUMI has real-time access to who is connected to the system and will provide us with the exact number of member federation and delegates participating 
and, and, and also uh, during, uh, during the voting. Be aware that to be considered as uh, having attended the Congress, a delegate must have connected using the LUMI system um, uh, and their unique login credentials. If you are attending with others as a group, only the delegate associated with the credential used for the connection will be listed as participant. It goes without saying, but I remind the Congress that obviously only one delegate per member federation is entitled with the voting rights. You may be, you may be up to three delegates uh, registered to represent the, the member federation, but only one will have access to, uh, to vote on the LUMI voting platform and to exercise the voting rights of the federation. Member federations have different voting rights. According to our uh, statutes, Article 36, it can be a three vote right or a one vote right. Referring to by law to Article 15 related to DEPS, the delegates of a member federation having subscriptions in arrears forfeit its voting right. We have therefore some member federations participating uh, in this Congress, but with no voting rights. Um, two final comment, only the identified uh, delegates with voting rights have access to vote on the LUMI voting platform. And finally, be also aware that the voting will continue even if your connection fails or for whatever reason. I think all these details are now clear and I'm now asking the executive director to proceed and present the member federation registered today. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. We will make a virtual roll call without responses. We will give you now the federations participating who have registered to participate in this call. And at the end, we will give you feedback on who is actually connected at this time. You will also see on the slides the allocation of voting rights. You will see some federations with three, some with one, and some with zero. So we will start now with the roll call of those that registered to participate in this Congress. Algeria, Angola, Argentina, Australia, Austria, Azerbaijan, Bahamas, Belgium, Belarus, Brazil, Bahrain, Bulgaria, Canada, Chile, People's Republic of China, Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, Cape Verde, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Denmark, Djibouti, Djibouti, Dominica, Ecuador, Egypt, Spain, Estonia, Finland, Great Britain, Germany, Greece, Guatemala, Guinea, Haiti, Hong Kong, China, Hungary, Indonesia, India, Ireland, Iraq, Israel, Italy, Japan, Kenya, Republic of Korea, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Libya, Luxembourg, Madagascar, Morocco, Malawi, Moldova, Mexico, Monaco, Namibia, Nicaragua, the Netherlands, Nigeria, Niger, Norway, New Zealand, Panama, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Qatar, Romania, South Africa, Russian Federation, Slovenia, nearly to the end, Serbia, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Switzerland, Sweden, Thailand, 
Togo, Trinidad and Tobago, Tunisia, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, Uganda, Uruguay, United <laughs> States of America, Uzbekistan, Venezuela, Vietnam, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We had a late entry of Bermuda the other night. So I'm pleased to say total member federations that registered to participate in this Congress, 91. Those with the right to vote, 72. Of those 72, 47 with three votes, 25 with one vote. Total votes, if everyone registered was to vote and participate, 166, which is a majority of, of 84, absolute majority of 84. Now, federations not voting today, but participating 19. So the actual situation from uh, Pete is that we have 59 federations with voting right currently present on the call. Now I correct that, 59 total member federations. That means 40 with three vote, 15 with one vote and four that are not able to vote. Thank you. And back to you, President. Thank you very much. Let me also welcome the confederations and the member groupings that are attending today. So we have COPARE, the America's Rowing Confederation, ERC, European Rowing Confederation. We have FASA that was uh, uh, recognized yesterday during our, our Congress. Welcome to FASA. We have ORCON, the Ocean Rowing Confederation. As for the member grouping, we have the Commonwealth Rowing Association, Coupe de la Jeunesse, XAR, Arab Rowing Federation, and Balkan Rowing Federation that were recognized <clears throat> by the Council, but presented yesterday at the Congress. Moving to point number three, appointment of scrutineers for the period of Congress, as presented yesterday at the Honor Congress, the virtual um, and electronic voting environment does not require any of you, any of you, the delegates, to act as scrutineers. We will proceed the same way. Let me briefly remind you uh, for the record the following uh, essential points. All voting will be conducted on an anonymous basis. FISA does not have access to the details of the vote. LUMI, the voting system service provider, is an independent, well-established and known company working for major international groups and companies, including the IOC. The voting system is totally secure and independent. <clears throat> and I, had ju I have uh, just said before, only one delegate per member federation has access to the voting platform and can exercise the voting rights of the Federation. When a vote is closed and the results are available, I will make the announcement and then Lumi will display the results directly from the system. Any questions? This is not the case. Moving now to point number four namely specific proposals from the member federations, the council or the executive committee. We have now reached actually what I would, I would call the core of the Exxonic Congress. Before we start, let me give you some general principles on this exercise and explain how we will proceed. As I already said, Thanks to the consultation process and the recent presentations, there are no surprises. And thus, I expect you to be ready with your in interventions. Due to the virtual environment, it will require some discipline and rigor in the way we proceed and in our speaking. 
to be as efficient as possible while keeping the formal dimension of this exercise, we suggest the following process for the review. We will start first with the statutes and the related bylaws as per point 4A of the agenda. We will consider one section or part at a time. For each of the section, we will ask you to declare any of the articles of that section that you would like to discuss. In other words, if you have remarks or comments of any of the proposal of that particular se section or would like additional background to the proposed change, please say it. Then for that particular section, we'll proceed in numerical order according to the following principle. In the agenda papers, you have a summary of the proposed major changes. We suggest to only stop to the articles you would have declared, you would have just declared and the ones in the summary. In other words, if there is no change or simply a wording clarification with no change in substance, we won't stop. When we will reach the article that you have asked to discuss or an article listed in the summary, we will then take more time for explanation and discussion. We will proceed in the same way for uh, the nine appendices related to the statutes as per agenda point 4B, the rules of racing as per agenda item 4C, and finally, the 16 appendices as per agenda item 4D. I hope uh, that is clear for everyone. Do we have any question or comment at this stage? related to this uh, uh, process? Any objections to this suggestion to how to proceed? Thank you very much. Uh, can I briefly add that we have uh, only one proposal to each of the changes presented in the agenda papers and therefore we don't need or we don't, we don't have preliminary votes planned today. Of course, if an alternative proposal were to be suggested by a member federation during this uh, review, then we would have a preliminary vote at the absolute majority according to article 38, uh, 36, sorry, to select the proposal that will then be submitted for change. I think uh, it's clear. If you have any question on that particular point, please ask. No question. Um, let me move to the voting process. Uh, we aim at proceeding in a quite similar manner. So let me emphasize that we are trying to make this as clear as possible to avoid confusion and keep it understandable. All discussion is planned for today and only voting is planned for tomorrow, as we have done for many uh, uh, Exxon Congresses in the past. Last minute changes can be very confusing. We know from experience, so we would like to avoid that. So we kindly ask you that this approach is respected for the good of the process and to create good governance documentation. Given this uh, new and awkward virtual environment, we would like to approach today as a chance to signal to us which statutes or rule changes cause you concern so we can better prepare the voting session tomorrow. I think it's clear. We want to anticipate the voting uh, procedures for tomorrow. So after each review today, the status, then the appendices, the rule of racing, and then the appendices for the rule of racing, we propose that you indicate that you declare to us which articles or rules on which you would like 
to have an individual vote. So after each of these sessions, at the end of, uh, of this morning, at the end of this uh, session today, the first session of the Exonic Congress, we will prepare the voting schedule with the individual votes requested. Uh, again, our attention is really to avoid an unnecessarily long list of electronic votes and to be as efficient as possible, again, while keeping the formal dimension. We will send out the voting schedule by the end of today, so you, are, you can prepare uh, yourself for tomorrow. Again, I hope this makes sense uh, and that it's clear for everyone. And if there is any objections to this uh, process or suggestions or comments, please do so. This is not to say I don't see any, and uh, I consider that you approve this uh, this pro process. Uh, allow me to highlight um, another point. Uh, also, the bylaws are under the council authority. We are submitting them to the vote of the Congress. They are part of the vote for tomorrow. By doing so, the bylaw will then be definitive so the rower and coaches can have certainty going forward to 2021. These were the uh, uh, points I wanted to mention before we, we start. And I think we have uh, now reached the review. And I will uh, give the floor to the executive director to conduct this exercise. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. So this is the first session, which is agenda item 4A. We will review the statutes referring to the three column document found on the website. During this review, we will cover by section of the statutes. They're called part one, part two, part three, etc. I would like to highlight one thing in particular is that on article 54, where we propose a transition to a Com different commission from the Women's Rowing Cross Commission. Um, we have made some research since we issued this and we found the United Nations and the IOC refer to this subject as gender equality, diversity and inclusion. So we are gonna modify the name of the working group and possibly the new commission to, to this reference, this way to refer to it. Um, now, when we come to Article 54, I, um, there will be an intervention um, that we will take at that point. So we will proceed to start our review. And like I said, it will be following this order in the statutes. And I will be referring to the summary of proposed major changes to the FISA statutes which was included in the agenda papers. I will now change to the three column document. One moment. Okay, as uh, Jean-Christophe said, we will highlight the um, key changes um, and 
but cover section by section. We ask you to stop us, let us know you would like to discuss an article. And at the end of this first session of 4A, of the covering of the statutes, we will pause to hear if anyone wants to call for an individual vote on an article for tomorrow. So the process now is to stop us, let us know that you would like to discuss any particular article when we go part by part. The first part is the general provisions, which has been adjusted to include the principles that we previously had in the section just before we started the statutes, the articles. So this text is coming from the Declaration of Principles. The change that you see at the top of the screen is the proposal to move to world rowing from FISA as the unique name of our organization. You heard this on our video presentation and uh, you have seen the discussion papers on this. So this is included in article one. The FISA emblem will, be, will stay, we will keep it. Those of us, me personally, 35 years working for being involved with FISA, um, it's uh, hard to lose it, but looking forward for all the reasons you've seen in our documentation, we uh, propose to move to World Road. Now, the Declaration of Principles have been moved into Article 2. And in the Declaration of Principles, we've em emphasized a few additional things, promoting diversity and gender equality. And we issued a document which sought to explain more fully the um, background to these changes. So I'm going through the principles and you can see the slight changes that have been made to provide clarity. Now I'm moving to Article 3, Objectives, which was previously in the articles, but uh, we've moved, reordered a bit and uh, reworded a bit not to lose the uh, meaning that we had. Okay, we've noted a wish to vote on Articles 1, 23, and 40. We will note that uh, at the end of this session. Thank you, Stefan. So objectives, no substantial change in objectives. Then we move to the next section, membership. And you will note that we have reordered, provided more clarity and emphasized safeguarding and safety. A lot of reordering and a lot of clarification on the text. The rights of member federations, the obligations bylaws to Article 13. Now I'm, unless you want to discuss anything, I'll move to part three, governance. And old Article 23. So it's a, a change of name to eligibility of Congress delegates. And we here introduce, propose to introduce the concept of uh, gender equity to the Congress delegates. And I have a raised hand. Can we listen now to a question from Dag Donskog? 
one moment, Dag, we are connecting you to be able to speak. Are you there, Dag? So now I'm here. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's not a question, it's more a comment to this uh, um, gender equality on the delegates. Um, we are not in favor, we do, we do not support this proposal. Um, yesterday we've heard that uh, FISA is uh, uh, a federation which is uh, very good in, in gender equality in all functions. And all uh, for all the, the, the people who are working with, um, if we if this proposal would have a majority, we will have a smaller assembly. We see what would happen today, and you see the number of delegates um, in in, uh, in in this kind of um, uh, congress when we have to only one person for voting, and you will have an, uh, much more observers or whatever. And it doesn't uh, help us in the, in the world uh, to, to be a more gender equality uh, world rowing federation, but it um, brings a lot of difficulties to the federations. And so I think it's not necessary. And we hope that a lot of people, a lot of federation will vote against this. And of course, I will ask uh, to make a separate vote uh, tomorrow for this article. Thank you. Okay, your uh, comment um, I'm not sure that you un it's understood correctly. You said that it would limit delegations. No, you still have up to three delegates, but that if you have two or three, both genders have to be represented. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not what you explained and you sorry. talked about limiting participation. Yeah, yeah, you will only send one because it's more easier. And so you will have smaller delegations if you are in trouble to get this gender um, situation and a lot of federations will be in trouble um, to have more than uh, to have gender equality in the delegations so they will only send one and this will limit the, the number of participations of, of delegates in, in uh, um, because it's it's uh, the federations cannot do anything it's not a question of the rule, it's a question of, of life, how it works. Okay, I, thank you, Doug. I think we have another hand. Henning, Henning, Nielsen, please. What? Is he in? Go ahead, Henning. Henning, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, thank you very much for putting this uh, proposal into the agenda list. And I have to admit that from Danish perspective, we uh, do not agree, agree with the German perspective uh, in the world I am living in. And as a Danish citizens, I think we need to uh, promote uh, gender equality and also in the rowing world, I think it is very important that we make rules so that federations promote women to, posi to positions in uh, the federation or in the political leadership of federations. So I think that this proposal from, from FISA or World Rowing as it is uh, from tomorrow uh, I think that is a, a step forward. And as a uh, 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 voting uh, right holder, uh, we in Denmark strongly support this. And we do hope that a lot of uh, rowing federations will support it as well. Okay, thank you. The first speaker was Dag Dangstok of Germany. The second speaker was Henning Bay Nielsen of Denmark. And now we have a comment from Carol Purser of Canada. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah. OK, 
Carol, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you. It took a moment there to connect. Good morning, everybody from Canada. Um, and thank you, Jean-Christophe and, and Matt, for this opportunity to speak uh, on this very important issue. Canada understands where FISA is going with the proposal of a transition from the Women's Commission to the much broader scope of uh, the now the Gender Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Cross Commission. But we do feel that the journey of the Women's Commission is not complete. If it is necessary to sacrifice one for the other, we ask that a commitment of greater resources be made for our important work that is still to be done. Please indicate these concerns in the issue, uh, sorry, these issues uh, in the minutes for us. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you, Carol. I see no other, uh, we have a hand. I see. Okay, Egypt, please, you have the floor and then Great Britain. Egypt, go ahead and give us your name. Let's try again, Egypt, you have the floor. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, Amri El Nouri from Egypt. Uh, thank you, uh, Jane Christophe and Matt for giving me the opportunity. Uh, we agree about this, uh, um, having the gender equality in, uh, in the uh, member federation uh, for the delegates. However, I would uh, suggest to add the sentence, if uh, uh, one of the other gender uh, apologized or expressed there uh, that they would not be able to attend, maybe it can uh, come from uh, the other gender to attend, both of them attend. Could you repeat your comment? If... I mean, if one of the uh, gender, uh, either women or men, apologized or expressed their desire that they cannot actually attend, then the other gender can both attend from the same gender. But I would actually promote the uh, equal um, equality in, in attendance, yes. Thank you. Okay, we take note of that. Um, I think that could be a bylaw actually um, that we have to work on if, if we agree. But um, I would leave that with the council please and we'll uh, meet tonight and come back to you tomorrow morning with an answer on that. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Andy Parkinson of Great Britain. Are you in? Thanks, Matt. Yeah, if you can hear me. Yes. Um, look, Great Britain is fully supportive of the motion that you're putting forward and supports the comments made by Denmark uh, and also Canada. We've got gender equity on the field of play and we as sports administrators need to make our own commitment to make sure we're doing everything we can to encourage women into senior roles. Thank you for the comment. I think we've heard both sides of the arguments now and we will move on, but thank you very much for those contributions, everyone. Now we will move to... Okay, let's bring in uh, Stefan Traxler of Switzerland. Go ahead, Stefan. Stefan, are you there? I think you're not far away from Lausanne. You're in Geneva. Please uh, unmute your mic. You, you can. Is it better? Yes. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, uh, Jean Christophe. The, the Swiss Rowing Federation fully agree that there should be equality, uh, gender equality, but we are wondering that the, the way to impose strict rules is the best way. We have, as said yesterday, there have been an improvement uh, without strict rules, and I think we should continue on that track 
without imposing strict rules as it is proposed in the modification of the statute. Okay. So we, we are in line with the German Federation. Okay, thank you for the comment. Thank I think we'll close comments now on this subject and keep moving. Thank you, everyone. It will be an interesting vote tomorrow. Quotas or no. Okay, now we'll move to the next article, which we believe might require discussion. That is old 33. But please stop me if you have a different idea. Okay. So this is the proposal to differentiate between an extraordinary Congress for an extraordinary reason, let's say, and the annual rules changing Congress. And we're calling that or giving it the name quadrennial Congress and creating specification for this Congress so that it's not confused with a extraordinary Congress, which would be called for obviously an extraordinary reason. Next is old 34 talking about auditing of accounts. And here we are proposing that the Congress actually approves the auditors based on a recommendation from the executive committee. And secondarily here, we have a bylaw, which we'll get to a little bit later about an audit committee and a finance committee. But uh, the key point here is that Congress will be asked under this to be the, the voting authority on the appointment of the in public accounting. Next is old 39. So this is the attempt by FISA to better divide the authority. We have consulted uh, Swiss banking and Swiss law. And you saw in one of our presentations that the real financial authority um, and responsibility and accountability is with the executive committee. So we've attempted to make here text at this stage in new, new article 38, which helps create a better understanding of the work of the council versus the work of the executive committee. And I wanna say we're really sensitive to the perception that there's a change in power from the Congress to the council or executive committee. We have tried as much as we could to use the existing words in the duty statement, which we'll come to in a minute, um, but, but creating a way to better understand the council is responsible for sport issues and the executive committee will come to in a minute as more managerial and administrative accountability. So this is the first of a series of articles which uh, attempts to better define the roles of these two bodies. Then we come to 40, old 40. And the first reference here is to the Athletes Commission. And uh, you'll see that at the request of the athletes, we have made uh, the election of the Athletes Commission chair to be an election among the members of the Athletes Commission. You, the member federations, will propose athletes to be members of the Athletes Commission. Those who are appointed or elected to the Athletes Commission will come to that later. Some of them will be elected directly by the athletes some will be appointments by the council. All of them will be proposed by the member federations. And then those members will vote to propose a chair from among, among them 
to the council and the council has the, the final stop to approve the chair of the athletes commission. So this is the first of a number of references to this um, change that uh, we are proposing based on our athletes commission and on um, what is happening in other international sport organizations. But we'll come to that a little bit later. So I'll ask you to hold if you have a comment on that until we come to the commissions. Next, I'll go to old 43 because I want to deal with some of these uh, later on. Okay, old 43 is the eligibility of council members. And we have taken this wording, the first group of wordings here from the existing wording. We've added this point two to add some clarity to about the, the importance of the chairs, particularly the chairs of the specialist commissions running their specialist commissions that they need to have the skills and expertise relevant to those positions. This is the technical sport element that we don't want to underestimate. So continuing, we have a hand, okay. Doug again, Doug Dansglock of Germany, you may make your comment. Okay, let's try now, Doug. So now I'm here. Do you yes. hear me? Go ahead. Okay, that only question, uh, why cannot be an umpire uh, electable for this positions as president when he was uh, attended um, at this kind of regattas? Because now you have rowing congress and council members and you have the rowers. And uh, maybe I think an umpire is only a fair job on the regatta. And maybe um, he should be only also a, a person which participated on four times on a major event. Okay, this is the existing wording which has been there for um, I think eight or 12 years, Doug. Yeah. So the, there's no change proposed here. And okay. that is a rather major amendment to an existing proposal. Um, let us discuss it at the council as a possible bylaw and report back to you tomorrow morning. Yeah. But, uh, you missed the deadline to think about that. Uh, in uh, line with the rules of, of this Congress. Is that okay? It's okay. Thank you. Moving now to the next, which is old 46. Okay, this is the duties of the council and we have reordered it and we've attempted, like I said previously, to use the existing wording but move it around to make it easier to read and to better explain the differentiation between the council and the executive committee. So please read it with that sense. And we really are sensitive to the thought that we are, are taking more power. We're trying to define better the powers that exist, the accountability and responsibility that exists currently. So it's easier for everyone to understand. And actually been working this way for the last couple of years with the council and the executive committee, and it's helped us understand our roles and responsibilities better. Continuing now to the bylaw for, for new 45, let's see. So this is the bottom here of your screen where we talk about an internal audit committee, which is a new body we're proposing based on good governance um, guidelines and suggestions that we've been following to have an independent look on what is happening with um, the, the, the financial elements and management aspects of FISA. We'll come to this a little bit later when we go to the appendix on this, um, but this is the first mention of this. And this came out of the ASOIF governance review, which uh, Jean-Christophe mentioned yesterday, 
um, and it's a it's a body which exists in many uh, member sport organizations. We'll move now to the old forty seven. Okay, we will come to this in appendix uh, S7. Again, uh, and just to say now that after the recommendations of the Swiss lawyers that we engaged to help us better reflect Swiss law and good governance, we have uh, reviewed the duties of the council members, particularly the president, the treasurer, and the executive director to make sure our organization has clear accountability and responsibility, particularly on management and finance. You'll see the main changes are there. Um, the bylaws actually were from the days of volunteering, full volunteer visa, where the treasurer had this authority. And now that authority or that accountability falls on the executive director, a lot of it. So it uh, puts the pressure on. Now we move and we'll come to that in a minute if you would like to discuss that, it will be when we get to S7. Now we come to old 49, where we provided a text here at the top of your screen to better to try better to explain what is the accountability and responsibility of the executive committee, so that it's very clear for everyone operating within these groups where the lines are. The other changes there are not significant, except for the Athletes Commission chair issue, which we will discuss when we come to the Athletes Commission. Next is Old 50. We have introduced the concept here of who is eligible for the executive committee. And we're proposing to expand it to basically all other council members. And the other issue here, the second paragraph there is when we come to the election to, of the person on the executive committee. So all of these people in the first paragraph there will stand individually in front of the Congress for election. So you will vote on who is on your executive committee, but from among a wider list of individuals. But they should have been in their position on the council for at least a year, or at least since January 1st of the year of the election. So it can't be someone who just comes into the council before we reach this on the agenda of the Congress. It's someone who's been in the, in the position for at least uh, since January 1st, okay? So all of the remaining members of the council are eligible to stand in, in front of the Congress for election to the executive committee under this proposal and only those that have been in their position since January 1st of the year. Next is old 52, which is the duties of the executive committee. And again, this is our attempt to better position for understanding of the accountability and responsibility of the executive committee. You see management, governance, general, So you can see there, we've attempted to use the existing words, but uh, um, organize them in a, in a more understandable way. And at the top of your page here, you see the reference to the finance committee. Um, the finances of FISA now are quite elaborate and detailed. So we called it the finance subcommittee previously. Now it's gonna be organized among members of the executive committee 
who will have dedicated meetings to review the finance and the finance situation, but the full accountability and responsibility for finance still stands with the executive committee. So they will prepare everything for the executive committee to make decisions on finance. And we'll come to this in, in Appendix S8. We'll move now to 55, the commissions. So we're proposing in uh, that the listing of commissions moves to the bylaw to create more flexibility because times are moving so quickly these days. In the middle here, you see the reference to the Athletes Commission and we'll come to that in a moment. Okay, we have a, a comment from Terry Dillon of Canada asking if the executive director will become chief executive officer. Um, we have not planned this for this Congress. It's, we, we propose to stay with executive director Terry. Um, and we were, we were too late to, to have that change made. Continuing now, the next change is the listing of, this, of the commissions. Let's start in on that now. You can see at the bottom of your screen, the proposal to create two new discipline commissions, one for coastal rowing and one for indoor rowing. In the uh, appendix, which is explaining the commissions, you will see the duty statements of all of these three commissions. And just to, to say it again, that uh, we propose to keep the competitive commission, to keep their name, competitive rowing. We consider rowing to be the name of the discipline of, of classic rowing. Um, and we modify that name to be coastal rowing or indoor rowing. And you will see in the appendix where the duty statement of the commissions are that, uh, that who composes these commissions, we will, we will put out to you uh, a process for you to propose members of this commission, these new commissions and uh, the council will make the selection. You will elect the chairs of these commissions at the appropriate time, which is covered in another section. Um, so this is the first part of this uh, article, New 54. Uh, we have a question from uh, Henny Nielsen of Denmark um, asking if the chairs of the commissions will have the right to introduce co-opted members. Um, it's not envisioned. Co-opted members, in my understanding, would be full voting, whatever, participating voting members, and that's not the case. We have some guests um, on some commissions to add some expertise, but they are not, let's say, official members of the commission. I'll move to the rest of this proposal. We have a coaching development cross commission so that uh, the disciplines don't become silos in knowledge and expertise and that we will create a commission but it will include members of the uh, three disciplines and chaired by the chair of the competitive rowing commission um, this is our approach to make sure we keep our coaching education program fully uh, integrated in the organization We propose to keep recreational rowing or tour rowing in the Coastal Commission for this four years because of the excellent relationship with, that uh, they have with the existing members of the uh, Rowing for All Commission. So the Rowing for All Commission would, would uh, be replaced by the two discipline commissions, Coastal and Indoor. There would not be a new chair of the coaching development cross commission. It would be the chair of the competitive growing commission. So we're not expanding the size of the council. 
and we will talk about the Women's Commission transition in, in a moment. Um, we also proposed that the Event Promotion Commission becomes a working group, which will um, meet um, separately from the commissions. Okay. Now the Athletes Commission is fully explained in uh, one of the appendices. So I suggest um, we cover that on when we get to that appendix because it's quite detailed there. Moving now to Okay, here's the Athletes Commission, um, where we start to make uh, comments about it, uh, consisting of elected and appointed members. Um, and I suggest we take that when we come to the appendix covering that. Okay, um, Henning Nielsen has a question. Recreational rowing is big in several NS. How do we, on an international level, ensure this area of rowing is served? Um, the answer, Henning, is we discussed this at the council um, extensively in Budapest, trying to um, find the best way to fit it. And basically, we want four more years to work on that question. What is the role of FISA in recreational rowing, which is primarily a local or national activity? We, we aren't convinced that we have a, a good explanation for that yet. And we propose to discuss it over the coming four years. We have flexibility to uh, change that as the commissions are evolving regularly. Um, but uh, we need to make a, a working group to figure this out and, and figure out really what is the role of FISA in this area. I hope that's a sufficient answer. I'll move now to 58. So old 57, you can see that we have not made any significant changes. Is that right? But we on 58, the bylaw to old 58 is is actually S10. So we will come to that when we get to the appendices of the statutes. Basically the commitment form becomes the, the FISA or world rowing commitment form, not just rowers. So this will allow us to continue the commitment form across all participants in our activities. Now moving to part five, integrity of the sport. We've added a second paragraph here you see on the screen. Taking into consideration the overall interests of World Rowing and its members, only individuals of high moral character and integrity may be nominated by member federations for elected or appointed positions. So we're counting on you, the member federations, to fully screen and um, pro propose possible members of FISA commissions or council to be proper, strong, high moral character members. But the executive committee retains the right if there's any aberrations to make a, a decision, a final determination. With all of the scandals in other international federations, we felt it was appropriate to add some wording in here um, to try to prevent scandals hitting FISA. Then the code of ethics, which we'll cover in appendix S11, has some additional wording on safeguarding. And you'll see on the uh, right of complaint, we've specified that it's the FISA president who's informed. Otherwise, it's the IOC 
uh, executive, sorry, ethics commission. So if it's a, a member of the executive committee, it goes directly to the IOC Ethics Commission. Here in old 63, um, we've worked out that this was a mix between the rules of racing and the statutes, and that we needed to create a, um, a rule about the judicial bodies empowered with the rules of racing at our competitions and the judicial bodies empowered in the statutes. So the new wording here or whatever the eliminations here are those that apply to the statutes. And you will find when we get to the rules that uh, there are judicial bodies now described in the rules. No major change in meaning except for this clarification. So a cleaning up of the procedural rules, some moving around, but we think no major change there. And we've called this section sanctions because it's been pointed out to us by a high authority that a reprimand is not a penalty, it's a sanction. And all the, and the we've cleaned up this article to um, the list, the possible sanctions that you find in the statutes and the sanctions that apply to rowing and racing are now covered in the rules. Okay, that covers the proposed changes to the statutes. And we'll pause for a minute and make a note of the requests for voting. I saw one, 23, and, and 40. 40. Those are the references to the old article numbers. Yeah. Anyone else at this point? want to call for an individual vote on any article. We'll give you a chance at the end of today as well to raise individual votes. 23, I see 23. Yeah, it was already. Canada. Canada wants a vote on the Athletes Commission amendments. So I'll take that to be actually the appendix. Not only, I would say. Where do we get that in the executive committee maybe? Or the council? It, it has impact on the council, on several executive. articles. So, yeah. or we sh could, we, could we vote for the appendix before? Uh, Might be. So Ian, uh, do you have a particular point where you would like to see that? Uh, I'm referring to Ian Bramble of Canada. Can you make a, a chat on the Q&A on the question and answer? We can cover it at the council where it's first mentioned. Okay, so I have old one, old 23 and old 40 so far. Plus, Plus athletes the Athletes Commission, Commission. one. And we'll see. Okay, Ian is saying no preference where it fits. Okay, let us, uh, yeah. someone we'll have, have a, a look at that and we'll report back. The best way to, to cover that, that, that comment. Okay. We, we to appendices. Move now to the appendices to the statutes. Okay, the first one is challenges to a member federation's eligibility. 
Um, we've had several hints, requests to rule on challenges to the authority of a member federation. So we've attempted to better clarify this in this appendix, this bylaw. I hope you've had a chance to look. Um, I'll keep moving unless someone has a specific question. Go ahead if you do. We're trying to protect you. Here's article appendix two, which is claims of external interference in the independence of a member federation. And we attempt to resolve a situation where a government takeover is taking place or something like this. Okay, I'm moving to new appendix three, recognition of the Continental Rowing Confederations. You voted yesterday for the third of our five continents. We still miss um, two. Asia. Asia. We have four now. now we have, we four. have four now, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, this is the guidelines, the rules of reference for being recognized as the Continental Rowing Confederation for your continent. And then we have the groupings of member federations. We now have uh, five as of yesterday. And these are no significant changes to what was already published. Um, better wording shifting around a little bit. Now we move to the Athletes Commission and I'll increase the screen here. So the proposal here is to have five members elected by athletes and five members appointed by the council. Help me if I don't get it right. I won't go into a lot of detail because we've uh, had this on a couple of the virtual meetings. Um, and like I said, there will be elections at certain world championships. You can see it in the details here. Five elected by active athletes, five appointed by the council, all 10 nominated by you, the member federations, and you can see in the proposal, the procedure for these 10 to vote to propose one to be the chair, to sit on the council and to become the eighth full voting member of the executive committee on a permanent basis. So we would retain the three council members who are elected from being on the council we have the officers and we would have number eight, which would be the athletes commission. That would make seven voting members because the executive director doesn't vote um, and give us an odd number, even though the president has the right to, the, to break a tie. So um, I would say, let's open the floor now if anyone would anyone like to add something to that? Maybe just, just just a comment because I, I actually I, I think it's a, it's a quite a, a big step in in uh, in the way we 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 will have athletes being part of our organization and initially it, it comes from a, a request from the athletes commission and also the benchmark we can have with the uh, with the in the in the good governance principle so that the athletes are um, not only part of the organization but also part of them are elected or representing um, uh, their peers. So that, that's why we have, uh, um, I would say, included this, uh, this principle. Then uh, when it comes to uh, put it in, in practical, it's been a, quite a significant exercise and not an easy one, I must say. Uh, also the principles are, 
I'm sure uh, you will agree and, and, and share the principle when it comes to uh, the application and the implementation, it makes um, it makes the exercise uh, quite quite complex. So that's why we don't want to to bother you with a lot of details. Uh, uh, but as Matt has mentioned, in addition to that, I would just say that we want a full equity gender uh, um, athletes commission. So uh, we will start it with the first with the uh, the elected ones, so that when it comes to the appointment, uh, the council can make uh, the. Uh, the, the, the right exercise to ensure uh, this key principle we want to have in, in the in the Athletes Commission members. And then when it comes to the chair, uh, this is also a, a big step in our organization to have the chair of the Athletes Commission in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in all the, 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 I would say, the governing bodies of, uh, of the organization. And it was, uh, it's important that uh, we, can, we can show how uh, the, 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 the athletes can take part of, uh, of the organization. Do we have, uh, meanwhile, I was talking, do we have any, any question or comments? I see some hands. Ian Bramble of Canada. Okay, let's give the floor to Ian. I think it's very early in the morning where you are, Ian, is that right? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Oof, lots of clicking. Um, thank you very much, uh, Matt and JC, and uh, the proposal from the Athletes Commission. This is a, a wonderful opportunity and certainly one, as, as uh, JC, you say, is complex, um, but such an important uh, step in, in the opportunities to elect athletes and, um, and really truly have that representation as, a, as an election. Um, certainly as a previous Athlete Council Chair of the, um, the Canadian Olympic Committee's Athlete Commission, when we took this step forward uh, in our governance, it had such a pro profound impact. Um, and it also had a great impact as it um, resonated through the Canadian Olympic Committee with other governance changes. Um, I suppose my earlier comment for um, a vote, um, because it's so historic and such an incredible um, journey forward, I do believe it, it's one of, of significance and, and I would hope it was captured that way uh, in the minutes through a vote. Um, but I did wanna um, show my um, and, and Canada's appreciation for this, this opportunity. So thank you very much. Point taken. Thank you. Ian, There's uh, not really a question it, in there. Can we more. can we address this at the end when we see how many votes we're going to have tomorrow to see if uh, if we can manage this in the virtual environment? Let's see. Let's see at the end if uh, if we're going to be able Thank to manage all this. <laughs> Thank you for the comment. Was there another hand? I, sorry. Switzerland. Christian Christian Stoffer, you have the floor. Yes, I have. There you are. I completely agree. I completely agree with, with uh, the uh, comments from uh, Ian, but um, I think the everybody who should be in the executive committee should be empowered and have the backing from the Congress, because as you represented the council who would appoint the, or confirm the um, chair of the Athletes Commission is now considered as the, the governing body for sports matters, you just explained. And I think the Congress is really the governance um, authority and everybody who sits in the executive committee should go through the Congress. I think it's not sufficient that each member of the Athletes Commission was originally nominated by a, a member federation. And I think it would even strengthen the chair of the Athletes Commission and this uh, really historic approach and the strengthening of the role of all the athletes in our organization if the chair of the Athletes Commission would be um, elected or confirmed
by the Congress and not by the Council. And I therefore would like that um, there will be a vote about who will be electing the chair of the Athletes Commission to the Executive Committee, please. Thank you, Christian, for, for, for this uh, comment and, and the suggestion. Just to, to give you a little bit of background of, uh, of the proposal, uh, and you, you, you certainly refer to the way the IOC is uh, uh, um, um, electing uh, IOC members. And as you know, uh, the athletes represented in the IOC are elected by their peers and then confirmed by the session. So the IOC members will elect the uh, the, 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 athletes, uh, the athletes that, are, uh, that will become I IOC members. In our case, uh, as you know, we will have part of the athletes who will be elected uh, during the World Championships, five of them, and therefore the Athletes Commission Chair cannot be elected among the, uh, uh, this, um, the, the members of the Athletes Commission uh, by the, the, the Congress that we held uh, usually at the end of the World Championships. It would mean to uh, convene a specific Congress uh, uh, after or to wait a, a full year before the Congress can uh, uh, ratify or elect the Athletes Commission Chair. So I do understand your comment. Uh, this is a point that we have uh, uh, actually uh, discussed and addressed. The practicality of it is, is quite difficult as, uh, as for the reason I just, uh, I just mentioned. Are there other hands? Okay, Henning. Henning from Denmark. Speak again and thank you. Thank you also for, for this uh, great meeting. So I would like to say that, that I fully agree with, with, with Ian from Canada and Christian from, from Swiss. Uh, it is very important that we strengthen the role of our athletes. And I think this proposal is step on the way and whatever we can do to increase the uh, visibility of world rowing among our athletes is, is very, very important. Uh, the athletes we have now is the future leaders of rowing. So we must, must do whatever we can to, to train them and to uh, educate them in the political, political system and especially in how the uh, world of rowing is, is uh, governed. So that was it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Christian, if I understood your question correctly, could you go to Q&A? You were asking that the chair is elected to the council by the Congress or to the executive committee by the Congress. Could you put, put that on the Q&A? Exactly your proposal. Executive committee. We heard you say executive committee, is that correct? Are you live, Christian? Election of the AC chair to the executive committee through the Congress, okay? All right. So we'll take that as a, a request for a vote, specific vote tomorrow. We'll, we'll find the appropriate place, probably in the executive committee. Yeah, but we will have at the same time to find the practical way for such, a, for such a suggestion. So I would say also we, we, we certainly can agree. Uh, I would like also to see how we can implement such a, such a proposal. It would mean at this, at this stage we, when we discuss it that we would delay the, uh, the participation or the, the, the election to the executive committee for uh, basically for a full, uh, full year until the next Congress. I'm sure you will uh, 
understand that we cannot convene a specific Congress for uh, only for the for, for such a, a point on the agenda. But uh, let's let's um, think uh, again on it, and uh, we will uh, we will come uh, back with. Uh, uh, to you with uh, with a proposal for for this specific aspect. Or can we turn it, Christian, that you have a look at these procedures uh, over the next couple hours and see if you find a way forward that you can suggest to us. Yeah, I can just add to that that it's been it's been an intense and uh, a massive exercise to to build and develop the proposal you have in front of you in terms of how to make it uh, to, to to make it uh, um, to implement it and and all these questions were were of course uh, uh, discussed and uh, and uh, if you can find yeah a better solution uh, it will be really welcome yeah, i can tell you we spent hours on this <laughs> procedure working through every practical implication and I don't know if it was mentioned that the the athletes of the IOC athletes commission elected the chair and the president of the IOC is the one who validates that election so the, no, I, the I, leading I, sport organization in our the, the, the difference is that the, uh, the, the athletes are elected during the Olympic Games and therefore, uh, the IOC is uh, convening a session the day after the closing ceremony. So to formally, uh, um, uh, once the, the elected athlete can be uh, formally uh, ratified by the session. So that's why uh, the IOC member are requested to stay the next day for this specific session, basically mainly uh, um, for, this, uh, for this reason. But we don't, we don't want to ask our, our delegates to stay for uh, uh, after the after the world championship and and actually because we we do have the intention to have uh, different uh, um, uh, athletes uh, from from the uh, from the world championship but also from coastal which uh, we and the world championship held at, are held at different moment in time so it's it's um, yeah we we have a difficulty there Okay, I'll acknowledge comments from Germany, Dag Dansglock, that he supports the idea of Switzerland. Um, we have a suggestion voting by letter or video conference. Um, mm. Video conference is costing us about 30,000 to, to <laughs> run this right now. And just to do that for uh, we can uh, be one sponsored. vote would be difficult. Okay, um, okay. let's... Uh, Maybe we'll have a call with Christian after the conference to see if he has any good ideas on how to manage this. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, comment from India as is supporting, I guess, the council's proposal. So if I propose we move on and then we take a coffee break after we get through these appendices. All right, next is Appendix 6, which is the definition explanation of uh, the internal audit committee. Uh, you've had this now before you for a while. Um, this is developed with the recommendation of the Swiss lawyers, the experts in uh, Swiss law and uh, federation um, structure. So we, I hope you've had a chance to look at that since it was published. Um, and I point out one should have a legal background, one should have a finance background. Um, and they're not individuals who currently hold a position. How do we describe it? Who are, do not hold elected, appointed, or employed positions within World Rowing. Moving to Appendix 7, New 7 which is the duty statement. This is where we have made modifications based on the recommendations of these uh, Swiss lawyers at the Carrard office who are really experts in Swiss law and federation structures. So we've modified a little bit here. I hope you've had a chance to look. The main modification is the treasurer's duties We've lightened the load on the treasurer, Gerrit Jan, who was a part of this. 
and uh, focused more accountability and responsibility on the executive director. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, but uh, this is developed by and recommended by these uh, experts um, as conforming with Swiss law, Swiss banking law, accounting law, and uh, recommended by Pricewaterhouse. I'll move down. Okay, no major changes on the rest of this. We'll move now to Appendix 8, which is the Finance Committee. And uh, I described this earlier that this is a group of executive committee members who meet separately to go through all the finances. We've had several meetings to develop uh, next year's budget, as you can imagine, uh, which you saw yesterday. Um, and thank you very much to Gerd Jan and JC for uh, all your time given to work through all of our challenges on finance. And they report to the executive committee, they have no authority, they present to the executive committee and it's in conformance with what the Swiss lawyers have uh, advised us. Next is the duties of the commissions and working groups. This first page is no significant change. Then we move to the second page where we have uh, some clarity and rewording of the competitive commission. Hope you've had a chance to look. No dramatic changes there. The membership is described here of this discipline commission. Then we move to the coastal rowing commission, the new proposed commission. And again, we, we propose that uh, you will see in the council election article, the timing of the election of these two new commission chairs. And in the meantime, we will uh, nominate, the council will appoint someone until the next election to the next Congress where this is called for. And we will ask for nominations from member federations for the membership of this commission. We describe their duties and responsibilities. We've added recreational rowing into the Coastal Rowing Commission for the next four year period until, as I described earlier, we have a, a strong explanation of the role of FISA with recreational rowing. Here's the Indoor Rowing Commission. Very similar looking words you'll see here but uh, really in line with our attempt to diversify and to be more inclusive coastal, getting islands, getting areas that don't have classic rowing, indoor rowing, capturing this huge population of people that we want to feel part of the rowing family. And this would be the commission which guides this discipline. And here are the membership um, guidelines for this commission. Next is the Athletes Commission, which we've discussed <laughs> extensively. <coughs> so they're acting on behalf of uh, under 19s, under 23s and elite senior, but the election takes place at the senior world championship for the classic rowing athletes. This is the coaching development cross commission which i described earlier and our intention is that they are guiding the coaches conference agenda so that it's touching on all the disciplines of rowing um, when we stage coaches conference equipment and technology commission no dramatic changes here some cleaning up, events commission, no dramatic changes here. The events commotion commission becomes a working group, not having a seat on the council. Masters commission, no dramatic changes. Para rowing commission, 
Congratulations to Paula from the election yesterday. Welcome to the council. Hopefully it will be a physical meeting someday soon so we can congratulate you in person. Rowing for all commission um, becomes coastal and indoor basically and recreational stays within coastal. Sports medicine, no dramatic changes, umpiring, some clarifications. So the women's cross commission You have seen the explanation in uh, the documents about this change, transition. Like I said, it would be gender equality, diversity and inclusion working group, which will figure out exactly what we need, our goals are in this area. We have a lot of models in member federations that are doing this. We have a lot of models from other sports uh, federations that are doing this. So we want to capture all this knowledge and be sure we really have clear goals and mission statements for, for this, uh, the, the diversity and inclusion element of uh, this transition. Anyone, we heard a comment from Carol supporting this and supporting the work on gender equality that we are doing. Thank you, Carol from Canada. You throwing commission, no changes here. Okay, we will move to the next one, which is the commitment form. And we're changing this to be the FISA commitment form or world rowing commitment form um, so that we can cover all, potentially all stakeholders who participate in activities of FISA. We started this journey with the rowers and we propose step-by-step step to expand it to the council, commission members, uh, international umpires, and potentially all accredited individuals at uh, our events. We have a Q&A that the Coastal Rowing Commission could be the Coastal and Beach Rowing Commission. Actually, Budiman from India, Indonesia um, we consider the name of the discipline to be coastal, and it has two formats, endurance and beach sprints. So this is our approach to this. I hope uh, that's understandable and acceptable to you. Turning back to the commitment form, um, we've added here wording on uh, respecting, safeguarding, and from for participants uh, to avoid harassment and abuse. So there's a reference to that. We've added the element of safety here. Um, and this is the, we'll cover this in the rules, but it, uh, I'd like, like to cover the, the swimming element in the rules. And we've attempted here to cover insurance, which will be in the rules section in a few minutes. So you can see the extra wording here to put on the table the element of risk of participating in an outdoor water sport um, as a part of participating at our events. Anti-doping, you're aware we have a WADA consent, data consent form that all participants have to sign. At this point, it's rowers. We've modified a bit this, uh, the section here of anti-doping. No major changes in the rest here on this page. No major change on this page. Okay, any questions on the commitment form? Again, it's signed once in a career, except when we change it then you have to sign the new one if you participate. It's a standard approach for every international federation, every, and every organization, basically. Here's the WADA athlete data consent form. You've seen this, it's in the rule book. 
Next, Code of Ethics, Appendix S11. Um, no major changes on this page, nor here, nor here. We've added uh, 3.9 here, linking to the IOC athletes declaration. Some clarifications, changes, no major change there. Here we've clarified the, the president It's a clarification of the procedure um, of a specific case. No change, substantial change in procedures. Penalties has been changed to sanctions. Now here is the important one, which is the right to publish a sanction related to ethics, making it clear from the beginning that uh, it could become public um, from an activity, whatever um, procedure that we carry out, but also possibly um, a member federation or outside organization. Next is the Athletes' Rights and Responsibilities Declaration, which is the wording from the IOC. No change proposed in that. Here's 11B. Uh, some updates to our safeguarding guidelines and procedures. Our procedures here. So here's uh, 7.2 on your screen, the bottom of your screen communication of sanctions. Please look at this carefully. This is in line with other leading organizations um, and other international federations that are handling this. So we are not recreating the wheel here. We're following uh, what is going on around in all the international sport federations. So have a careful look at that. Uh, sorry, mutual recognition of possible cases by member federations. You can read here how we will handle that in the future. And this is in line with other international sport federations. The report form. This is the Former Appendix 9, now Appendix S12, related to the statutes about manipulation of competition. No major change here. Okay, that covers the appendices to the statutes. President, back to you. Thank you, Matt. So as uh, we have said earlier, so we would like you to uh, indicate or declare which of the articles you would like to uh, be put for a vote, an individual vote for tomorrow. So this has been, uh, we have collected some of, uh, of your remark. Um, and then uh, I suggest that we have a short break unless you, we have some comments or question at this point in time, it's not the case. So uh, I would suggest that we, we have all uh, five minute breaks. Please be ready to resume the Congress at 10 past two, and we won't be late, 10 past two. Thank you. And yeah, one recommendation is to not to disconnect from uh, the system. Please stay connected. Thank you.
10 past. Dear delegates, I suggest that we resume uh, the Exxonic Congress uh, and thank you for being with us. Uh, we are conscious that actually we are running a, a little bit late in, in, uh, and we would like to propose you to, uh, to accelerate and, and to be uh, as efficient as possible. So we suggest, um, I'm sure you have prepared this, uh, this uh, Exxonic Congress and you know which of the article and which of the rules you would like to have a discussion, as uh, we mentioned earlier on. So we, we suggest to prioritize actually uh, the discussion when uh, the, uh, a debate or a discussion is needed and not to go through, uh, uh, to, 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 to waste time and go through all this, this, the rules. So we have identified from our side a few key uh, uh, rules that we would like to, to, to discuss, but obviously uh, uh, it's, it's your Congress and, and you should uh, uh, indicate us uh, if there are articles or uh, rules, sorry, that you would like to, to mention. So I will, I will give the floor to, uh, to the executive director to start with this uh, prioritization. Meanwhile, please do indicate in the Q&A uh, the, the rules that you would like to, to, uh, to discuss. Matt. Okay, thank you. Um, again, we are gonna address now the rules Maybe, of racing. Matt, sorry to, to, to interrupt. I have a, a, an additional point. We would like to cover the point five uh, B, B and B, C, C and D today so that we, we have the discussion before the voting tomorrow. So we suggest that wherever we are, we stop the review of the rules by 22, so that by 22 the hour, so that we have the necessary time to uh, uh, share with you uh, the, the point 5B, C, D uh, before we have the voting tomorrow. Thank you and back to you, Matt. Okay, and special hello to New Zealand, Australia, Japan, hang in there, it's, we're getting there. So we are now on the session about the rules of racing, this three column document that you see. And I just have one remark, oops, to say um, you saw in the circular, um, the exchange with the, the Dutch Federation and we have agreed, as you can read, because of the limitation of uh, discussion with the virtual means here to withdraw the first three sentences of the new rule 29 so that it can be discussed when we can be physically uh, together again. So I'm gonna move, I'm gonna ask you to raise on the Q&A any particular rules that you would like to discuss. Um, otherwise I have a couple that we want to be sure to, to mention here. While you're thinking, I'll move to a couple that we consider to be important. And that's the new 13. The new 13, it's uh, addressing um, gender and we have created a appendix, a bylaw, which assesses a change in gender. It's, it's important as a responsible international sport federation that we have this covered. And this is our proposal to be sure that we can cover the uh, a change in gender by a rower. One of the, I'm moving now to new 14. One of the most important points of being a rower is being able to swim. And we think at FISA events that all rowers need to have the ability to swim or tread water. Um, fundamental to the safety of the participants. So we're proposing to add in that uh, rowers entering international events and particularly FISA events need to be able to swim. And this is a responsibility of the member federation, which many of you are addressing, many clubs address clearly before they go on the water, but it shouldn't go without saying it should be addressed in our rules. Okay. 
Okay, I'd like to move to 36, new 25. So we propose, as you know, that we do not make any changes in the events at the World Championships now, having missed uh, the 2020 year. To go back, you recall in 2017, we changed to a gender balanced event program. And that took place in 2018 and 2019. And we were hoping to look at participation levels in 2020, but we can't. So we are going to ask tomorrow that the Congress passes the authority to next year's Congress, sorry, to the 2022 Congress to reassess the events following the entries we see in the 2021 season. And we also propose that we get rid of the uh, natural death rule and it be a proposal from the Congress, from the Council to the Congress based on data and analysis and uh, uh, instead of a one-off individual voting. So it's a block vote for the program for the next four years of world championships. Moving now to what I just mentioned, the innovation rule. Here it is. New Rule 29 in a, at the bottom of your screen, we are proposing to eliminate this first sentence, the first three sentences, uh, and go with the basically the current rule. It was just an attempt to try to provide a little more background. Next, moving to old 62. New 51. The point here is near the bottom is that we give the authority to the jury to decide if there's a safety risk for a crew or for all the other participants at an event, if they do not have the competency to row in a Boyd regatta course. Um, we've had a couple of cases where it was a very new crew, very new crew to rowing that uh, we had to hold back from competing because it was not clear that they could uh, safely participate. Um, we also want to specify in during training that training at our events may only take place during the official training hours so that we are sure we have the rescue and safety crews in place to provide a safe environment for our rowers. I'd like to comment on new rule 64. We have created a rule which better explains re-rows after some of the experiences, particularly last year. Uh, it's a term that is not widely used in other languages. So we're, um, we've attempted to put in existing practice on re-rows into a rule so that it's very clear for the coaches and rowers. So that concludes what we would like to discuss on rules. And we're looking for anyone who would like to discuss any particular rule. Please let us know. Henning, can I uh, talk to you about your comment offline? And we, that's a rather large question which we need to cover offline. 
anyone else want to discuss one of these rules? Otherwise, I'll move to the appendices of the rules. Just a moment. Okay, the next section is devoted to the appendices to the rules. We call them Appendix R and then the number of the appendix. Um, there are 20 of them or more. So I would like to actually um, ask you if there's anyone in particular that you would like to discuss because it's a, it's a big process. These are considered uh, bylaws under the authority of the council. We've submitted them to you for your comments and questions. I want to address the proposal received from the Swedish Rowing Federation, which was circulated with the agenda papers, um, asking for unlimited uh, advertising on the decks. Um, we've The council has discussed it and decided not to make the suggested change at this time but launch a full analysis of the use, current use of advertising spaces by member federations during 2021 and assess the sponsorship market in 2021 in the post COVID-19 period and come back to the Congress in 2021 with some more analysis and uh, suggestions on this topic. So I'm looking for anyone who would like to discuss a specific appendix related to the rules. I'm sorry, what? Okay, Dag Downsglark from Germany has a question or a comment. Dag, go ahead. Dag. Go ahead. Are you unmuted, Dag? Let's try it one more time. Is he unmuted? Dag, we can't get you. Can you write your comment maybe and I will repeat it on the Q&A? Okay, now we're asking again for any individual rules you would like to have an individual vote on tomorrow. Please give us in the Q&A. Okay. We have a comment from uh, the German Rowing Federation, Jens Undertmark. The German Rowing Federation would like to support the proposal of the Swedish Rowing Federation to increase the visibility of sponsors on boats. Based on our observations, the expectation of commercial partners in terms of advertising and branding opportunities goes far beyond what we can grant today. Given this, we strongly believe it's time to think about a paradigm shift from allowed advertising space as we have it today in our bylaws toward a reserve space policy that grants fees of boat builders and event hosts advertising space while the rest of the whole is open for commercial branding. In this sense, the Swedish proposal is a good start to find a compromise along this road. We would love to see a clear assignment from the extraordinary Congress to the council to work on an updated advertising policy within due time. Thank you, Jens. You have our commitment, but we want to make a proper analysis and a 
prepare and address the subject uh, in whole so that we get it right. Um, that we will discuss this with the council and come back to you tomorrow morning uh, on exact, on a little more detail. Okay, we have a comment from Terry Dillon about rule 13, the gender rule 13 seems in line with other international federation, but is quite controversial, especially the testosterone levels. We are concerned that female athletes may unknowingly have higher levels of testosterone. I read somewhere that up to 70% of female athletes have elevated testosterone levels about the minimum, above the minimum recommended above the minimum. I don't have a good answer to this, but recognize the challenges. Um, to comment to Terry, this is changing on a daily basis. And we are, we have a, a group dedicated to this, an expert group dedicated to this, that is following this closely with the other international federations with the IOC. And that's why it's a bylaw and also by our legal experts so that we don't go too far out from um, a solid legal position which could jeopardize FISA. So it's a bylaw, we can update it on a regular basis, depending on what court case or experience is out there. We are in close communication with the other international federations. Dr. Steinacker is following this very closely with his team and we have a dedicated group, which we met at the last joint commissions meeting to discuss this issue. So it's a very serious issue. And uh, we believe that we have taken the steps with this appendix to reflect current um, practice among international sport federations. So thank you for your comment. Jürgen would like to take the floor. Jürgen, come in. Jürgen Steinacker is the chair of our Sports Medicine Commission. Go ahead, Jürgen. Is he unmuted? Go ahead, Jürgen. One more time, one more try. Jürgen. Okay, if he comes in later, we'll do that, but uh, let's keep going. So we pause now for a proposal to vote on any individual rule or appendix that we have proposed to you. Anyone? Okay, we will give you another chance at the end of the Congress to come back to any article, rule or appendix. And we'll take a break, a pause at the very end of the Congress. So think about it now. And I think we'll go back now to agenda item five and I'll switch yep. my screen. Agenda point five, five A has been covered by the executive director just right now. So we can move to point five B. And Matt. Okay. Um, Given the situation with COVID, as you know, we were not able to stage international world rowing events this season. And it's an important point because <laughs> the determination of voting rights and the determination of subscription fee level is based on participation at world events. So we propose for you an alternative approach which will be finalized before we hit the Congress in Shanghai. And you've received this paper, I won't go into detail, but this is our proposal to you, which we will ask for a vote tomorrow at an absolute majority for a temporary solution for this issue, for these two issues actually. So voting rights, Article 36, and membership, member subscription, Article 14. Um, 
we will submit to you after the under 23 championships next year, the new calculation so that the new voting that takes place in Shanghai will reflect what's happened 17, 18, 19, and the beginning of 21. And then for the next time, the next extraordinary Congress, now quadrennial Congress, um, we will use 21, 22, 23, and 24, and cross our fingers that 21 goes ahead uh, very well. So I'll stop there and see if there are any questions about this proposal related to voting rights and member subscription fees. Okay, well, continue thinking about the articles and rules and we'll move, President, back to you. We'll move to point 5C and over to you, uh, Matt. So this is addressing, again, the COVID pandemic and impact on our statutes and rules. And in fact, we um, want to be sure that it's clear for everyone um, that when we refer to the Olympic year for force majeure reasons, we, have, we are doing everything as though it was the Olympic year, but uh, it doesn't change going forward um, how we will handle things. We hope and we trust that we won't face this situation again in uh, 2024 and that everything can go ahead. It's a rather detailed point here, but uh, I hope it's clear for you that, um, that uh, we are interpreting the statutes and rules in this way. Um, Dag is now back online. And uh, let's try again, Dag, with your comment. Sorry, Dag it's okay. Dag of Germany. Yep. Yeah, sorry. I, it's OK. Jens Hundert Mark, write what I want to say. It's everything OK. Thank okay. you for the all right, Doug, thank you very much. Okay, uh, any questions or comments on 5C? We hope it's clear. So we will ask for your approval at a majority, absolute majority tomorrow. Okay, we'll close down 5C and move to 5D, President. Thank you. So here we come to another essential point on our agenda. Uh, Rule 37 says that the FISA Congress shall vote to select uh, a recommended Olympic program that the FISA Executive Committee shall uh, uh, submit to the IOC. In that respect, uh, we have on the agenda of this uh, extraordinary Congress, the vote for the Paris 2024 program. I mean, the rowing uh, events, of course. Uh, so uh, you have heard on several occasions and, and you have read, we have read in many uh, of the reports, uh, but allow me to give you a little bit of the, of the background and the context and at least a, a condensed version of it. Uh, the future of our sport is closely linked with our position within the uh, Olympic movement. We, we strongly believe uh, that we must keep the strongest uh, possible position within the Olympic uh, uh, movement to ensure uh, the best, the most viable uh, and sustainable future for our sport. Being in the Olympic program, is crucial and, and you know that uh, if we are not in danger per, in danger per se, uh, uh, we are like, like the other sport, I would say, we are at risk in the sense that we cannot take for granted uh, that we are simply safe like, like, like it is in terms of, uh, of, uh, of our events and, and our quotas. That led us to the proposal program for Tokyo 2020. If you remember that the, the, the FISA 2017 Exxon Congress uh, voted 
Uh, and as you know, uh, this program was then approved uh, by the uh, executive board of the IOC on the 9th of June, 2017. And I referred yesterday actually to this uh, letter from the IOC uh, director general in which uh, he also uh, insisted upon further dialogue, dialogue and discussion about the program for future games, uh, including the, this challenge or the, the, this issue uh, around the lightweight and the weight category. So we launched uh, a project to address the ongoing pressure and the challenge from the IOC to find a way to save uh, uh, the lightweight, but the outcome uh, was not conclusive, as, as you know. Uh, then we uh, adopted, or actually we adapted our Olympics strategy from what I call a defensive attitude to uh, this more uh, ambitious and proactive uh, approach. This was discussed and shared with you at every opportunity, so you are all uh, fully aware about, uh, about that. Let me also shortly remind you that the sports on the program are decided by the IOC session made of all uh, the IOC members, but then when it comes to the, uh, to the program itself, to the events and to the quotas, this uh, remains under the authority of the IOC executive board. So the decision is based on a recommendation from the IOC uh, Olympic Program Commission, which is built through uh, an analysis, an evaluation of the Olympic Games. And you know, this evaluation is made event by event. This process was, uh, uh, has to be carried out actually in consultation with the IFs, with the International Federation. And we have been very much in, in, in cl closely in, in contact with the IOC uh, to discuss uh, uh, this, uh, this matter. You will remember that uh, uh, the Tokyo program was finalized in June 2017, so quite late in the Olympic cycle. Uh, and the IOC has resp responded to our request that for this, uh, for, uh, for this time, I mean, for the 2024 uh, Olympic Games, this decision uh, could uh, um, come a little bit earlier uh, at the end of the 2020 uh, year and not uh, uh, to waste another six months uh, to know for the, uh, for, the, for the Olympic cycle, with, which would be uh, uh, too late for the, for the team to prepare. So uh, um, in that respect, just let me know that the, uh, the challenge for the IOC to make this evaluation by, by a, a short deadline was quite, quite tense. But to come back to 2020, and, and, and towards the final IOC decision, where are we? I would like first uh, to, uh, uh, to highlight the very open and constructive uh, attitude and attentiveness uh, uh, we've received from the IOC in, the, in that matter. Uh, we have pursued uh, the, our approach and, 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 and the ongoing discussions, also including OBS, as you know, the Olympic Broadcasting Services, and had few meetings to further uh, uh, present uh, the discipline, uh, coastal rowing, the background of it, and the rationale about uh, uh, and the argumentation behind our proposal. Last February, like all sport uh, on the Olympic program, FISA submitted uh, its initial submission uh, for the Paris 2024 Olympic program to the IOC Sport de Department to start with uh, this uh, very uh, uh, specific, uh, um, I would say, to go into the details of, of, of the proposal. In line with our strategy, the submission included the ambitious uh, uh, proposal of adding um, uh, three coastal rowing events, the women's and the men's uh, solo, and a mixed double to make up for the loss of the lightweight doubles. To be clear, this, um, uh, this proposal is in full accordance with the strict criteria and, and, and principle set by the IOC, uh, namely, first, achieving uh, 50 percent uh, of female uh, participation across the Olympic Games at, at event and discipline, uh, discipline level. 
Second point, reducing the overall uh, uh, athlete quota, including for Paris, this is very important to understand uh, the additional sport to 10,500. So the, uh, the, number, the total number of athletes in Paris will, be not, will not exceed 10,500, and this including the additional sport, which was not the case for Tokyo. I remember the, the additional uh, sport quota were beyond the 10,500. Third point, uh, uh, third criteria was to prioritize the new events that do not require additional athletes uh, uh, for, the, for the IF and, and, uh, and that, that the proposals should be within the, uh, uh, the quota that uh, have been uh, allocated to the, to the IF. The fourth and very important uh, uh, criteria as well was to uh, ensure to use existing venue for any proposed new event. You know about the, about the context and, and you have heard about the agenda 2020, the complexity and, and, and the cost. So we believe that our proposal is again, fully in line with uh, uh, this, uh, this criteria. The feedback uh, we got on the sporting dimension and on the interest of the discipline has been, I must say, very positive, very positive. A discussion with the IOC were constantly uh, uh, open and very constructive. We are able, as I said, to introduce uh, 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 the discipline, to share our arguments um, and, and within also, I must say, a more general uh, uh, perspective about uh, the stakes of Agenda 2020, for example. I'm able to say that the, the, the reactions were very positive towards the sporting, the sportive value uh, of, the, of the discipline, which has quite a relevance in more than one regard. Attractiveness was also confirmed by the OBS, which is uh, an important stakeholder in, in all this, uh, uh, I would say, uh, exercise. So that was the, 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 the situation then when the COVID-19 crisis uh, uh, arrived and, and, and actually disrupted a little bit uh, about uh, our process for two reasons. First, on the timing, and, and secondly, on the context. So let me explain a little bit. On the timing, obviously, the management of the crisis as, uh, at the IOC mobilized all the resources. And in fact, for obvious and understandable uh, reasons, uh, the subject, this specific subject, uh, has, somewhat taken, has somewhat taken a back seat. This is absolutely understandable. As you know, uh, they had have a, a massive uh, um, exercise to deal with the, uh, uh, the consequences of postponing the, the, the game. So then, uh, despite the, the postponement of the Olympic Games, the, the IOC executive board decided to maintain and, and actually they confirm the date of December this year, December 2020, for the executive board to finalize and to decide the program uh, for 20, uh, Paris 2024 in order, in order to avoid, again, uh, impacting the preparation for the fol following Olympic cycle. So I, I think the, uh, the dates are uh, December 8 and, uh, uh, to 10, as, uh, as Denis Oswald told me uh, yesterday. So this date, this deadline has been confirmed uh, uh, in, in, uh, for, 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 the, for, for the process. To move ahead with the full analysis of our uh, proposal, the discussion with the stakeholders, uh, the IOC, uh, OBS, I was mentioning, but also then the OCOG of Paris 2024, the organizing committee, all these discussions have become more technical and have moved, moved and, and, and focused, and this is absolutely understandable, normal, uh, and legitimate. Uh, at the, this discussion have moved on the cost and complexity uh, aspects. Uh, an assessment on, on, on this specific matter, an assessment, a full assessment on, on cost and complexity was launched to evaluate more uh, precisely the actual feasibility 
for a coastal roaring event uh, to be um, uh, to be uh, staged during the Olympic Games using the sailing venue in Marseille um, as the option to access the um, as the, the option to access actually the the surfing venue uh, was um, uh, was excluded as an option by the IOC. So the only possible option would be to share uh, the sailing venue in in Marseille. So it's this exercise. It's all about as as you can imagine. It's all about uh, space allocation, uh, cohabitation with uh, with sailing. Uh, it's about accommodation, and of course, as it comes to uh, to the games environment, uh, transport and, and security. This assessment is uh, currently carried out and uh, I have to admit not completed. So it's clear that uh, uh, to come back to the context I wanted to, to, to share with you, uh, uh, the COVID-19 crisis has, has changed this, uh, this, uh, our process, not only on the timing, I just explained, but also on the content. I will tell you that uh, Paris 2024 is actually experiencing, I mean, is strongly impacted with the, with, the, uh, with the crisis. And without going into much detail, you have certainly read, read uh, many papers or, or, or on news on this point. The OCOG Paris 2024 is currently seeking to save 10% of the operational budget, which is approximately uh, uh, the budget is operation budget is 3.4, 3.5 billions. So it means uh, they are currently in the exercise to reduce uh, or to find uh, roughly 350 million euros uh, in reduction of the expenses. The support of the government, the French government, and, and also uh, of the president of the French Republic himself is certainly uh, uh, total and, 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 uh, and full, but conditioned on the respect of the uh, operational budget. And this is, uh, as you can imagine, for Paris 2024 in this context, uh, very extremely uh, difficult uh, uh, and, and, and tricky to, to, to be clear. So this is just to give you with full transparency the, the, the context in, in which we are at this point in time. We are now uh, uh, reaching another step of this process, not at, at the right time, I must say, but as you know, the FISA uh, Congress decision as per Rule 37 has to be made this weekend. So this, the situation is actually today not what we had expected in our, in our process. We, we thought we would have been much more advanced with the discussion with the IOC to make a full strong uh, um, a proposal that was basically uh, uh, in, in line or, or, or fully admitted by the IOC. So as of today, again, we don't have a, a, a clear position on the outcome of what the IOC is going to decide. Even the IOC, I must say again, does not know at this point in time what will be their position towards our proposal. There is a, a, another aspect to that is that they have also not only a specific approach with our discipline, with our proposal coastal, they have also to see the big picture with all the sports requests or the new discipline and will make this analysis at, uh, for, for, all the, uh, at, 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 for all the sports. So we wanted to really to give you uh, in full transparency the, the, the context. And, uh, and as you know, we, we, we have, you have in, the, in, in uh, your agenda papers, uh, the proposal that the council is recommending for approval to the Congress today. To make it short, we have a strong and relevant proposal. The proposal makes a lot of sense in many aspects and has received, again, a positive, not to say a very positive interest from the IOC. Moving from the principles and the interest to the more actual analysis in the context I've just described makes the exercise even more difficult. As of today, and we want to be very transparent with you, we have no guarantee 
no guarantee on the final outcome uh, of the, the evaluation of this exercise and, and, and basically on the decision of the IOC executive board. And again, in addition to that, the pressure coming from this uh, uh, COVID-19 environment and, and all the, 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 consequence, uh, the consequences of this situation makes the context even harder, even tougher than it, is, uh, it would have been in a normal uh, situation. That being said, uh, we remain fully committed uh, uh, so to our proposal and the council therefore recommends that the Congress strongly approve the 2024 Olympic program uh, proposal in front of you. Any questions, any comments? I'm just waiting if there are comments or questions. Yeah, I'll acknowledge the comment of your, uh, first of all, uh, there was a mistake <clears throat> in what the paper we sent you. Uh, I hope it's very clear. It's not a mistake. It was presented um, not clearly. I've updated the slide here on the screen showing the three events of coastal rowing that uh, are proposed. Um, what we didn't mention, JC, is that we still uh, are offering them both formats of coastal rowing discipline so that we have maximum flexibility uh, when we discuss this with the organizing committee and the IOC. Yeah, this is not uh, specified in, in, in the proposal we want you to, uh, to vote for, but uh, uh, we want be as flexible as possible in terms of the format, in terms of the, 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 the timing during the, during the two weeks of the Olympic Games. We have offered the maximum of flexibility to, 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 to make our proposal uh, a, a stronger. And, and, and that's the point effectively that uh, I, did not, uh, I did not mention. Um, <clears throat> other Q&A, uh, we have a proposal from Denmark to call the coastal double the twin. Um, we'll take that under consideration. Um, we have a, a comment about the lightweight category from Bermuda. Yeah, we, we, have, we will discuss with you offline uh, the history of the lightweight category and uh, the story if you haven't followed that for the last few years. Dag Dansgok says, we thank you for the negotiations with the IOC. It is a good program. And we had a question from Monaco, uh, whether it would be beach sprint or endurance coastal. And uh, I just addressed that in the, in the comment we just made. We're keeping both options still open. Dr. Steinacker has written um, basically saying uh, what I explained to you that we have an expert group which is advising us on gender issues and change of gender issues. Um, and we are following that very actively. So thank you, Dr. Steinacker. A question from Christian Stoffer. Thanks for all the information about the process to include coastal rowing in the Olympic program, but with the COVID-19 uncertainty and the unknown parameters, is it necessary to vote about keeping the Tokyo 2020 program if things and circumstances change and there would be no venue for 2024. So if I may, if I may answer to, to, to Christian, obviously uh, uh, we wanted to be very transparent with you. This is a very tough and difficult uh, environment. Uh, and again, with full transparency, effectively, we cannot grant, guarantee the, the positive outcome of our proposal. But I must, I must be very clear that this is our commitment to move as long as possible with all our effort on this, on this proposal. And, and obviously uh, 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 we will keep you informed. We propose actually to convene um, a, a, a virtual member federation meeting um, in, um, 
uh, right after the decision of the IOC. By then, we would have certainly we would have got more more signals and information, and that we will share all along the uh, this uh, this very last uh, hundred meters before we cross the line. So still uh, difficult, and and obviously it is our responsibility to uh, uh, to push until the limit where we can, and also our responsibility to adapt uh, should the situation be uh, uh, be adverse. But we don't want to 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 uh, to go further in that in that route at the moment. We're still uh, fully committed on our our proposal. Okay, we'll take a pause now and open the floor for, again, any articles you would like an individual vote, any rules or any appendices. Okay, Rowing Canada requests a specific vote on rule 13. That's new rule 13, Carol. Yes, new rule 13. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, I'm putting it on the screen. Carol, would you care to take the floor and uh, tell us a little bit more behind your request? Okay, Kara, Carol, sorry. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi there. Um, thank you very much again uh, for giving us, uh, giving Canada the opportunity to speak. Um, it's, it's, it's mostly about it. It is very controversial, as Terry pointed out in his comment earlier. And because it is, and there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into the, the decision making process, we just feel it should be separated out. So it is, is, um, it is a specific decision that we make as an organization, as opposed to part of many other uh, rules being decided upon. Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right, we're down to three minutes. Any other requests for rules or articles or appendices? So as uh, JC said, we will be preparing the voting schedule for tomorrow, plan for tomorrow and send that to your email addresses by the end of the day, the day here. And uh, hopefully you can study that so we have a clear process for tomorrow. Back to you. Thank you. And, and if I may make a, a comment, I take your, your point to take some very key or specific uh, uh, changes as an individual vote, not because of, uh, of uh, the outcome of the vote, but just to make it clear and, 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 and so that we can, we can build on it and make it uh, like it was said by, by, by Carol from, uh, from Canada, uh, to make it clear our position as, a, as an organization and it's better than having a decision, I would say, in, in the middle of, of many others. So uh, I take this uh, comment or this point to maybe identify when a very, I mean, a, a key decision for our, orga on, uh, our organization is made just to, to highlight uh, uh, such a, a decision by a, a vote that will show um, a, a little bit more than in the middle of, of the rest. So we, we take that point and thank you for, for this comment. We will have a, a quick look at, uh, at uh, how, many, how many points we would like to, to, to have this, um, this approach. Thank you. Um, one minute to the hour. Uh, last chance for any uh, comment or, uh, or question.
it's not the case. So I would like to thank you very much for your contribution to this, uh, to this session. We want to, to keep on time uh, and I wish you a good night or a good, uh, good afternoon or a good day. And uh, I'm uh, looking forward to speaking to you again tomorrow. We will resume the Exxonic Congress for the second session at the same time as uh, today. So thank you very much and uh, speak to you tomorrow.